Well, Merrill was an uh, energetic boy. And Merrill, as a child, used to always go around the house singing songs and uh, carrying his little baby sister around singing songs to her. It's funny how Merrill looked one look at me and said, um, that's the girl I'm going to marry. And this is the way he went from then on. It was Thanksgiving Day, 1961, and I'd been trapped in a horrible snowstorm in the middle of Oregon. You know, it's a little different at that day than it uh, is on a day like today. When you see the sun shining and the beautiful scenery around, and you can see these mountain peaks. I'd actually landed at uh, the little place called Beaver Marsh, Oregon, the day before Thanksgiving, in this horrible snowstorm. I thought Merrill was a very handsome fellow when I married him. I thought he was attractive because he had a good set of teeth. His, his hair was attractive, beautiful waves. Got up the next day, the weather had cleared somewhat, and I wanted to be back in Spokane with my family because I hadn't missed a reunion with them one time in all of my life. I taxied the airplane up to the north end of the landing strip, warmed up the engines very well, and took off going to the south. Got about uh, maybe 200, 300 feet uh, above the uh, trees and about a quarter of a mile from the runway when all of a sudden both engines quit. should have landed straight ahead. Of course, there are nothing but huge pine trees there, and so I thought about landing on the road, yet there were nothing but cars, and I didn't want to tangle with those, so I made the next best decision, which was really the only decision I had left, and that was to try to make a 180-degree turn and get back to the end of the runway. The airplane was starting to shake, and I knew it was going to stall at any moment, so we had to pick a spot and actually fly it down into the trees. I remember hitting uh, one tree and knocking the top off. I hit something, uh, uh, hit my head on something uh, in the airplane and was knocked unconscious. Uh, the airplane traveled about 100 yards and through the trees, uh, bouncing from one tree to the next. Uh, you notice even this uh, one tree up here that shows uh, a lot of the scars. I think the way it spun it around in the airplane then continued on tail first. and. It came to rest in the trees, and uh, I was unconscious when this 108 gallons of gasoline that was on board uh, exploded and caught on fire. Uh, when I first opened my eyes, I was just surrounded by flames. And looking at it here, you'd hardly recognize that this thing was an airplane or that it could actually fly. Now, this is the end of a near-fatal airplane crash, but the beginning of something new that God was doing in our lives. We'd had coffee with a young fellow. We were going back home. Immediately after we got in the house, we heard the motors cutting out. So then that's when we ran out in the yard to see what had happened and seen the plane was going to crash. And after, we, after I could see the plane was going down, I got in my car. As I drove up and stopped, the young fellow was coming out of the woods, just real close to the highway. He looked terrible. His face was burned. His jacket was burned. I couldn't even imagine how he could see to walk. But he had gotten out of the plane and walked that far when I got there. Now, many things could have happened at that time, you know. When I awoke, I was in the flames with my eyes open, breathing the fumes. And yet today, I still have 20-20 vision, wear no corrective lenses. My throat was not hurt. I could have very easily seared my lungs, and it could have taken my life. 
I fell down into the snow and looked back, seeing this huge big ball of flame, and that's all I saw for a long time. Everything that was exposed was burned. My whole complete total face was burned off of my hair, my hands. But the coat I had on was a sport coat made of some synthetic material, and it hardened just as hard as asbestos. And they had to break it off of me in the hospital. Even if I would have survived, where would they have gotten a skin to replace my face and my hands? Because you see, my forehead and my temple area comes from right in and the right side of my body. The chin and the cheeks come across the center part of my stomach. My neck area comes from the lower part of my stomach. The nose and the eyelids come from the upper parts of my arms. I got to the highway by listening for some cars and some fellows I'd had a cup of coffee with just a few minutes earlier come down in their car to see if they couldn't help me. They picked me up and put me in the back seat of their automobile and started me on the way to the hospital. You know how I must have felt at that time. Here I, my face was completely burned, my hands were burned, and I reached up and opened up one eye so I could see the skin on the back of my hands, and, and then I laid down in the back seat of the car. Instead of desiring, you know, feeling like crying out in pain, as would be the normal thing, I all of a sudden felt like singing. And I sang all the way to the hospital, and all the time that the doctor wrapped my hands, the next day when my wife came to see me, the doctor made a statement to her, said that, you know, Mrs. Womack, we lose more patients from the shock that accompanies a burn like this than the burn itself, yet your husband didn't have even the slightest bit of shock. It must have been the song that he was singing. That song was so important, and I've come to regard it as one of my favorites. It goes like this. I found a sweet savior, and now I'm made whole. I'm pardoned and have my release. His spirit abiding and blessing my soul. Praise God. In my heart there is peace. Wonderful peace. Wonderful peace. Peace that the world cannot give. When I think how he brought me from darkness to light, there's a wonderful, wonderful peace. I um, went to his room, and I went in, and I went to wash my hands, and I looked out of the side of my eye, and I saw this man in the uh, bed, and... Um, the look of the man that I saw on the bed was um, something I didn't want to claim as my husband. And uh, I whispered to myself, dear God, don't let that creature be my husband. And uh, he heard me washing my hands in the pan. And uh, he said, is someone there? And right then and there, I knew it was my husband because the voice was Merrill's. And um, I said, yes, honey. I'm here, and I went over to the bed, and um, I'm not exaggerating in the least when I say his head was as large as a basketball. It sat out here on his shoulders and uh, was just fantastic. It was like a marshmallow that had been put into a fire and left till it was charcoal black and it had swollen up. His whole face was charcoal, absolutely black, and you couldn't even see the eyes. And then his hands were all burned also, just right through this whole area. And right here, they were just held up tight and just some places white and some places black. But most of it was all through here and on his face. You could hardly even see his nose or find his nose at all. His mouth was all puffed up and his face was probably about this big around. When Dad called up the day of the accident, we thought that he was just great, you know, because he talked, he sounded just great on the phone. I thought, well, he, he didn't break any bones and he sounds really good on the phone, so why even worry? And then when we found out what actually happened, we couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, this actually happened to our dad and how could God actually let this happen to him? He was getting curious as to what he looked like, what his appearance was like and we decided we better take all of the mirrors out of the room because he is a man that has performed in front of people and he was a very handsome man and uh, we didn't know quite the doctor was especially interested and concerned he didn't know quite how he would react if he saw himself in this condition so we took all the mirrors out but um, he was a, a pretty sharp person and one time he could see a tiny little slit 
of chrome, and he could see his reflection in this chrome. And um, he saw himself in this chrome, and I had been out for lunch at that particular time and came back in, and he was sitting there very, very solemn in bed, and I asked him, what's wrong, honey? And he said, oh, nothing special. And I said, well, something's wrong. Since I've left the room, what happened? And he said, well, how can you stand by me when I look like this? And I knew the words that I used and the things that I would say at that time would remember and stay in his heart and his mind for the rest of his life. And I said, at that time, I, I just prayed to God to give me the right words to say. And I said, uh, Meryl, beauty's only skin deep, and I love you for what's within, not from what's not because of what's outside. We had a group of kids, uh, I went out and back and tried to play ball with Dan. And we must have had uh, two dozen neighborhood boys come in, you know, and they were just staring, what is this? It bothered Dan a little bit at first and he wanted to fight them off. And it's, it's almost in the same way we went downtown and uh, I'd walk down the street and it was so funny. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful that I felt that way about it and Virginia did too. People would walk by us and then they'd walk clear around the block again to see me the second time. Or walk they'd back, back up. up. It was funny, they'd, they'd start backing up with us and walk with me. And uh, the kids, in a way, like we'd get into a restaurant and we'd be eating and someone would sit there and they'd just stare. And the kids felt like standing up, you know, and going over and telling them, uh, stop it. <laughs> so they closed up one eye completely and left the other eye only about the size of a little pea that he could look out of. And uh, so he couldn't see the people that were on the side that were staring and looking at him. But we, as his family, could. And the little kids in the restaurant sometimes would scream out, and Mommy, Mommy, you know, what is, what is that man? Look at the monster. Yeah. I remember somebody who said that he had a mask on. Well, remember my, um, one of the guys I babysat for came to the door one night and told, told Dad that he'd make a good guy for a horror film because of the way he looked. One of the things that really helped us to get back out again was to come to a conclusion, understand our own minds that we look different. So I knew people were going to look. And you know, we just arrived at a place of saying, well, yeah, they're going to stare. And if they don't stare, there's something wrong with them. They have to be a little bit stupid. Because if I was out on the street and I saw somebody that looked like me, I'd look. First time I went back on a trip for the company was from Seattle to Los Angeles. I remember getting on this big commercial airline and sitting down next to a gentleman who looked at me once and he looked back again right away. He wanted to ask me, of course, what happened to me. But he didn't ask me right then until we got out onto the runway. And we started down the runway and all of a sudden he turned to me and says, what the happened to you? Uh, well, he asked me, I'm going to tell him. So I said, oh, I had an airplane accident. <laughs> and that poor guy, I could see his feet just going like this right against the front of the, the back of the next seat. And he sat that way all the way to Los Angeles. And I can still remember when we touched down, he went, whew. Merrill, I'm real happy to see these skin grafts that we placed on the back of your hands are working so well. I remember your hands were fixed just about like this, and you couldn't even move them in the beginning. And now, the greatest news I think I heard was when you called me and said you'd now be able to play the piano again. I knew I had to start using my hands again if I was ever going to use them. And You know, since I couldn't see anything, I could just uh, had one little slit in my eye that I could, I could see couldn't watch television, couldn't read books, none of these things. So I thought maybe I could sit down and start playing the piano. And then trying to do so, the fingers were so tender, I couldn't even push the keyboard down to get it to strike a note. So I thought about, well, maybe we can rent an organ. And I called a friend of mine who was in the organ business, asked him about rental of one, and he said, no, Merrill, I, I can't rent you one, but I'll let you use one. And uh, he brought one out, and for the first few weeks, I, I sat down and by the hour would sit down and just it's so refreshing to me to just sit down and... Oh, how I love him, how I adore him, my breath, my sunshine, my all in all. It was during this first time when I was home from the hospital, that the church asked me if I'd come back and sing for them if I was at all up to it. I remember the first time I went into the auditorium, some of the people that saw me, of course, they had, we were friends for many years and it hurt them to see me the way I was, no doubt. 
So I only had one eye that I could see anything out of it all. This eye was completely closed and one little slit for the right eye. No bridge of the nose. The skin just went right straight across from cheek to cheek. My lips were completely pulled open so you could just see all the gums and the teeth right here. We had one dear woman that felt that um, he shouldn't get out to church in that appearance, that it made her sick and she had to leave and go home. But thank the Lord he had given us a song again. And one of the numbers that I sang that night was has always been so so dear to me and I'm sure that that uh, it has grown to be one of the most well-loved of all Christian hymns. Because, O oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands of me. When he came to Polson after his visit there, I was impressed to do something that would perhaps be meaningful to him. At that time, I decided that I would try to obtain some of the pieces of the wreckage of the airplane in, from Beaver Marsh, Oregon, and I did that and uh, welded this assemblage. And the head is made out of one of the gauge covers taken from the dash of the airplane. There are pieces of the fuselage in the legs and in the arms. In the chest area, the springs that run vertically across the uh, chest were taken from the pilot's seat. I think that perhaps this sculpture symbolizes uh, the way that God has worked in Merrill Womack's life uh, in uh, what perhaps in another person's life might have spelled uh, defeat and disaster. He has turned it into a victorious thing. And well, Merrill has been the greatest inspiration that I've ever seen for anybody that has a severe injury and then takes charge. So many people we have that have these things quit. They just give up and they go hide in the corner and they just don't go out into life and uh, realize that no matter, even if I have a little deformity, I still have that precious quality of individuality of life even though it's been changed a little bit. There was one time when they worked on, on my hands and had to work around the nerves. I still have one nerve that's pretty well exposed. When I touch it, I feel it up in my fingertips like an electric shock. But uh, when they worked on these, Virginia was afraid for me, you remember, honey? They, the doctor even was fearful because I was in such a depressed mood during this particular time. It was the only time of all the operations that it ever depressed him. And then but it hit the nerves. Very much so. And I went home uh, really feeling just really out of it. And I spent about two horrible, ugly, lonesome, weeks. Uh, again, I, I really feel myself this was God's way of working with us because I hadn't felt this, hadn't experienced this. And if I had not experienced that in some way, I could not relate to people who do experience it mm -hmm. because of something happening in their lives. We went through two weeks of not being able to come out of this depression, not being able to get out of it. And the strangest thing, and I, I say this, I strangest thing when people talk to me at that time, you know, like we had well-meaning Christian friends, good friends who would come by and say, well, trust God, everything will be okay. And it just drove me deeper into depression when this was said. And the strangest thing too, even the scriptures that before that time had been, had buoyed our spirit, made us feel better, made me feel worse. The more we would try to read the Bible and pray and talk to others about it, the deeper we got. It seemed like the the Bible just wasn't answering our, our needs. But a wonderful thing happened Beautiful at that time. A, a man that I'd been singing in a quartet with, that I'd been playing ball with before, the strangest thing, one night he came to our house at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, for, he was leaving in the morning at 5 o'clock to go on a trip, but he was right. laying in bed at night and all of a sudden he said, uh, and he, talking to his wife, said, let's go visit Maryland, Virginia. I have So to. here they take and he gets, he gets in, uh, in his car, he and his wife come over to our house and they walk in. You know, they don't start saying to us, how do you feel? You shouldn't be feeling this bad. You know, all the normal cliches. But what they do, what he does is start bringing up experiences that we'd enjoyed in the past. Good ball things games. that we'd enjoyed. The ball games we'd played on, the games we'd won, quartet. the games we'd lost, the quartet singing. Beautiful things that we had enjoyed. And you know, before that man left that night, uh, this, the depression was gone and uh, we were alive again and uh, didn't try to preach to us, you know, but he just came and shared. Right. And we needed it at that time. And in the sharing. 
It was beautiful. And the sharing was a strength. And uh, but that's that's probably was the lonesomest time, the worst time. You know, there is sometimes depression. God allows depression too, but through it there was a beautiful lesson learned. But he always asked for guidance in the thing, and he always asked that the good Lord keep me going and keep himself going and uh, his wife and family, because these are tremendous trying times for any family that gets mixed up in some type of uh, really major catastrophe, which this is. When I say, fellows, that I, can, I think I can understand what you're going through when you lay here, we spent some 50 weeks in the hospital, as I told you. During that time, we had not only you know, not only the skin grafting that you see here, where all of my face and the, and the hands, all of this was, was replaced, and all of the skin on my face. But along with that, I had phlebitis in my left leg. Two blood clots went through my heart. They had to tie off the two major veins. Had pneumonia in both lungs. Had staph infection for five weeks. I shouldn't really be here, except that I feel God wanted me to be here. You know, the, ama the wonderful thing about it, fellows, the peace that God gives, the strength that God can give, no matter in the, in, the, in the worst of circumstances, even the times when you might fear as you're laying down, look, I've had enough, <laughs> I've had enough, yet understanding that God is alive and just to never give up, you know, to go that extra little mile, to believe, to have strength and faith to believe that we don't let the problems get the best of us, but we really get the best of the problems. The last hospitalization was just a year ago, and sometime this year I'll be back in again. I'd like to just uh, sing a song for you, one that has really come to be a, a little bit of a, I might say, a little testimony song to me, you know, because uh, God has always, always been with us. He's promised to never leave us nor forsake us. We've been through some problems. He doesn't promise, fellas, to keep us away from the problems, but he promises to take care of us through the problems, through the circumstances. Now, you listen to the words of the song, would you, as we sing them for you? I've been happy before. Sing it again Through the dark lonely night He will guide me and then I will look in his face Amazing grace I'll be happy again There was someone before There'll be someone again beautiful singing you've ever heard in your life because this man it has an excellent voice and uh, has cut a number of records and uh, actually in this one operating room scene this one night uh, it was done under a local anesthetic and the whole operation he sang and sang and sang the whole time do I want to be back the way I was before none no I want to be the way God wants me to be this is the way God has led us this is what God wants and we pray with the idea, Lord, whatever, hap whatever is your will. Now, sure, I, I really feel, I definitely feel that God is such a God of miracles that if he wanted to, he could turn me right back into the new flesh and look exactly like I looked before the accident. I believe that. But that isn't what I want. What we want, we want what God wants. I'm what he wants me to be. I'm where he wants me to be. I look the way he wants me to look. 
I'm not disappointed on how the surgery has come out at all because to me, um, well, like our son says, uh, he's more handsome now than he was before. And this may seem hard to believe on some, for, for some people to believe, but um, this is the way we feel. I'm sure it's been hard on Dad and everything, having the scars and everything else, but I've got a big security there with my dad living. It's wonderful when you have a, a wife and children family who behind you, my own immediate family. You know, wife could have said that, boy, he sure looks different and, and not really wanted to be with me or ashamed of me when out in public, but they went that way. Kids still uh, acted very proud of their dad, no matter what I looked like. And friends who were always there, and family who was alongside all the time and what a strength this means you know to, to just have the the family and the children the friends all right there with you i feel sorry for anybody that doesn't have god to lean on because we couldn't have done it without the lord but i feel that he brought us this way for a real real purpose and if we had to do it all over again if some way we could go back and blueprint our own lives Say, this is what we would like to happen in the next 12 years. We wouldn't change one bit of it. I've been happy before. Sing it again. 